As we know that, you know, there's different ways in which we can assess yeast. There's blood testing, there's um, organic acids, there's stool testing. So let's go more toward um, stool testing. How does Genova evaluate GI yeast and what are those methods? Yeah, yeah. Great question. And on the GI effects, first and foremost, we actually measure it via culture um, where they're taking the stool samples, put them on culture medium plate to see what yeast grows. And we can give you a semi-quantitative look at how much is there. The good thing about culture is that the fact that it's growing on a culture plate implies that it's alive, right? So if it's present, we can then actually take that specific yeast species and run sensitivities to that live, live yeast, which is important clinically. The second way we look at yeast on the GI effects is something called the KOH prep or the potassium hydroxide prep. And what this does is you, you take the stool and you, you apply this stain and you can look under a microscope to see, number one, if yeast is present. Oftentimes we're looking for budding yeast, which is what's being circled there, to kind of get a feel for is it replicating. But I think important to note is that we can't tell whether it's live or dead um, under the prep. And we know that just from our data, greater than 95% of all KOH preps are positive for some yeast because it's in our food, it's in the air. And again, you don't know if it's alive or dead, but some clinicians find it helpful to gain a little bit more understanding of the yeast burden. But this leads to the other question that often comes up around PCR. Yeah, and the eternal yeast question, right? So I think PCR is another thing that we should be considering, should be talking about as it relates to evaluation for yeast. Um, I think there's two things to understand about PCR evaluation for yeast is the, the first one being what Patty was talking about. PCR is analyzing DNA material. And so if you're quantifying DNA material, you don't know how much of that DNA material is coming from an organism that is live or dead. Right. And so that's always, and as Patty mentioned, we're constantly being exposed to yeast uh, in our diet through just the air we're breathing. Um, you know, we're constantly being exposed to that and the body is managing and taking care of, of a lot of it as well, as evidenced by the fact that we do see, you know, an overwhelming majority of people showing up with positive yeast in the KOH prep but not necessarily in the culture analysis, which gives you this idea that there's, um, we're, we're constantly shedding yeast in our GI tract, and that's not always indicative of what's viable yeast living in the mycobiome. And that takes me to the second point with respect to the, the mycobiome is we know that yeast are supposed to be in the GI tract. We know that the GI tract consists of Saccharomyces, Candida, Malassezia species. And the thing is that when this has been studied in the literature, a lot of times it's, we're evaluating it via whole genome sequencing. And what that tells you is relative abundance of yeast in the GI tract. So, for example, you know, just making up numbers here, there's 60% of the yeast is Saccharomyces, 30% of the yeast is Candida, 10% is Malassezia, and I'm just making those numbers up. But it's essentially telling you relative proportions of yeast. But if you're doing a PCR analysis for yeast and you're trying to do a quantitation, we haven't established what actually normal levels are. We don't know, you know, okay, this is the threshold at which candida becomes an overgrowth situation rather than just becoming part of the mycobiome. And I think the last thing, the, the three things, I mentioned two, but the third thing is that um, when you're testing for, for PCR for yeast, we would be expecting a lot of positives just because we know that it's, it's in the mycobiome and we're seeing it on the KOH prep. So you have to establish then what is a normal amount. And I think that's still where we're, we're trying to, to figure out those odds and ends in the literature. You know, and I just wanna add something really quick before we move to the next um, clinical pearl is I always like to tell clinicians, treat the patient, not the test result. Sure. You also want to see those symptoms that signify we have issues with yeast. That can be anything from foggy thinking, memory difficulties, joint aches and pains, skin, bumps, lesions, itchiness, general urinary symptoms, GI tract symptoms as well. 
And if your patient displays even carbohydrate cravings, you know, if your patient displays some of these symptoms, then we do need to consider looking at treatment. And I'm not sure about you all, but for me, what treatment looks like is there's a big dietary component when it comes to yeast. You sure. don't want to feed them. So it's decreasing the sugar, the yeasted, the molded foods, as well as looking at some kind of a anti-yeast, um, whether it's a botanical or whether it is a more of a prescriptive agent. Um, yeah. Do you guys have anything to add to that? No, I always go to diet first, actually, de depending. Um, that's the biggest one. I think the biggest driver is decreasing sugar and carbohydrates and wine and, and, and things like that in the diet is a good place to go, depending on the clinical presentation of the patient, obviously. Yeah, I think everyone's going to have a little bit of a different clinical opinion around when they start treating. And I, that's one of the reasons why on the report, you know, for a general candida species, maybe not a candida albicans, we wait until a four plus growth before we call it a potential pathogen. And even then we're calling it a potential pathogen. Mm -hmm. right? Which is just telling you, okay, this may or may not be causing some issues. And so you start comparing that to the clinical picture and then determining, okay, is this a conversation about sh sugar avoidance? And we just need to limit that because maybe it's a normal member of the mycobiome, but it's just gotten an opportunity to overgrow a little bit based on the diet. Or do we need to go in with some heavier hitters? Absolutely. And trying to figure out the root cause too, right? You know, that's what we're all about as functional medicine clinicians is what is the root cause? You know, do we have an insulin glucose issue if somebody keeps getting recurrent yeast infections? Is there something going on with the immune systems? Do we have an autoimmune disease? Is there a chronic viral or a chronic bacteria infection that has not been identified? You know, it's really about just understanding, you know, especially in those patients that keep getting yeast infections, like why? What's what's going on here? Yeah, is there a microbiome deficiency, right? We always talk about the more free real estate that's available, the more opportunity we have for some of these uh, least attractive organisms. They start to take hold and grow, overgrow.